The First Amendment, do you remember Congress or what can't Congress do? Make laws that they can't make laws that do what? Our constitution. In the First Amendment, which ones? First Amendment, yeah. Freedom of speech, they can't make laws abridging that. You do not have blanket freedom of speech. What's another one they can't make a law? What's that? Press, what's another one? Religion, also assembly, and petition. You do not have blanket rights. The point about the Bill of Rights, there's a lot of gray area. And remember, at first, up until 1868, the Bill of Rights only applied to what? Mm -hmm. federal. Only federal. Did not apply to the states. So we got to the second. Where did we finish? We just said arms, right? When we just talking about arms and the bell rang? Was that it? Yeah. Yes. We were talking about what? Deterrent. What is an arm? It's a military weapon. It's a military weapon. An arm is a military weapon. So it's a weapon that's specifically designed for the military. So that's why a hunting rifle is not an arm. But a cannon is, or a bayonet is, or a brown bass musket is. Because they're not good for hunting at all, too inaccurate. Or for that matter, a thermonuclear bomb is an arm. That would not be good for hunting. <laughs> It'd be cooked as soon as you got it. Would, it, it, it you get cook like into millions. powder. <laughs> and so, that was the arm. And so when they wrote this, what they were thinking is, okay, we're talking about military weapons. And to give you an idea of what they were thinking, I'll turn the light off so you can see it, but that is the last draft Madison wrote before he came up with the final reading of the, of the Second Amendment. And so, sorry, wrong way. So it says, a well-regulated militia may necessarily be security of every state. Okay. But this one, a well-regulated militia composed of a body of the people being the best security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed, but no one religiously scrupulous of their arms should be compelled to render military service in person. So that was what Madison was originally going to write. That was what he did, and then at the last minute, literally, after consult consultation, they changed the bits. And that's why it's important to understand what he means by people. He does not mean individual people. He means the body of the people, the right of the people, meaning the people, like us. That's what he meant. So we, citizens of a free state, can start a militia. Do you see why he took out this? How do you define this? They didn't want to mess with people if there is, they want to call the militia out and they said, no, I don't believe in this one because of my religion. What is your religion? My religion is the church of not being in the militia. <laughs> Churches in the church are not having people shoot at me. I might argue that's not being an effective religion, but it's very hard to define. That's why they took that out. But that is the gist of it. So, regulated, well-trained. That's what he meant. The well-trained militia, we all can have this, or sorry, for the state, for the people, and have military weapons. No, it's not referring to personal weapons. It's referring to a militia. And now yeah, they were really clear about it. There was a little bit of it, and I think Grant mentioned this right for the bell ring. Right? There was an issue of we wanted a militia because they're fearful of a standing army. You better have a militia. Standing army equals tyranny. Militia, that means a people's army, less chance of a tyrannical government using that military. And that's why I don't know what the founding fathers would have believed because they're gone now, but clearly that they would have been shocked by the size of our military today. But that was the militia. And so it means you can't have any weapon. And if anybody says your Second Amendment rights, <coughs> no, well, that's not really it. <coughs> the Supreme Court has ruled many times with that. In 2010, they did make a ruling, it's called 
DC, or Heller versus DC, and the Heller decision said that the Second Amendment implies potentially that you could have some weapons if you read the Ninth Amendment, basically. It implies it if you read the Ninth, because it doesn't say you can't have arms. And it was a really hackneyed ruling, and it was a 5-4 ruling that was very controversial. Yeah. So basically, if they like, could actually take away all our weapons? Well, no, it doesn't say that. But what it says is the Second Amendment, that's not it. Yeah, because the Second Amendment is about military weapons. But I want to do this right now. The Ninth Amendment, it's really hard to follow, but it says the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall be construed to deny or disparage other rights stand by the people. Ah. What the Ninth Amendment says this you have rights, even if they're not listed in the Constitution. Did you catch that? Yeah. You have rights, even if it's not listed. So you're not restricted to just those rights. And so the argument made would, the argument would, would, could be made that personal weapons, could, people could have those under the Ninth Amendment. And that's the big. That is the big. That all started in the 1970s. It all started in the 1970s. Crime rate exploded in the 60s. The first gun control ha laws happened. And uh, well, people were worried about either guns being taken away or arms by gun manufacturers worried about declining sales. Literally, just started talking about the second. Before that, it was never. No, they just, I mean, everybody knows about a militia. Big court case in the 1930s where people could have machine guns. They just said, yeah, second amendment. Second amendment. Yeah. And the big reason for that was gangsters, but yeah. But in the in the 70s, all of a sudden people start talking about. It. So that's kind of the historical background of that. But in reality, it's a not ninth of. Now we can read all kinds of stuff into this one, can't we? So it's not clear, but it's that's where the Second Amendment comes from. It's like you raise from all of them. Oh well, yeah, and they word it in such a way it's kind of awkward. So I can understand why people get confused, but. They you know, what they were saying, we got to know what they said, what the words meant, so we can apply them through to that. Yeah, my guess is something else will come up with this. And even the Supreme Court ruling that said the Second Amendment implies this, they said that government can still regulate guns. It said that in the rule. So yeah, they can still regulate, meaning some weapons can be, uh, can be made illegal or harder to get or that sort of thing. Yeah. Automatic military style weapons, especially, which is very odd to have those, you know, That's, assault rifles. Isn't that kind of a little backward considering they start off as you can have military arms, it, but now we can. It doesn't say we can, it oh. says the well regulated, regulated oh. militia can. Nowhere do they say you can have a, a, a camp. Mm -hmm. Even though, yeah, some people did because it was hard to regulate back then. Does anyone have a cannon? Anyone have a thermonuclear bomb? A few? Keep that secret. Then we'll take off. <laughs> All right, let's get to the other amendments very quickly then. And yeah, this is this is a it's an interesting thing, but you have to get into the politics of the seventies and eighties, and it's just really it's a fascinating thing. But a lot of times you see people talk about like Second Amendment or other things. They're not really talking about what they meant. They're making up. They're using it as a political tool today. That's what they're doing. And sometimes it's easy to get fooled by that, which is weird. We read Federalist Number Ten, and they only cared about what's best for us. I thought totally. You learn something new every day. Next. By the way, anybody watch the vice presidential debate? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was dull. I think Penn slightly won, but either one's very good. <laughs> but I got to say, real, two funny things about it. The Republican National Committee announced that, without a doubt, Pence, the Vice President of Germany, won the debate. He won the debate clearly by how he performed on the debate. They issued that an hour and a half before the debate, the debate began. And after the debate, CNN had a poll of people who were watching the debate in Richmond, Virginia, and said, how did who won? And all of them raised their hand for Kane. And they're going, 
How could Kane win this? Yeah, I'm saying another guy goes, well, Kane is from Richmond. And he was the very popular mayor of Richmond. Maybe this isn't a good analysis. I just thought that was funny. Oh, so, Amendment 3. No quartering of troops. And the reason they did that, remember the Boston Massacre? Do you remember <laughs> the coercive acts? That's why that's in there. Three, no quartering of troops. Four is one we need. Four is the right of the people to be secure in their persons, house, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, so not be violent. So, no search or seizure without a warrant. The Townshend duties and the coercive acts allowed the British government to search without a warrant, called the writ of assistance. So that happened by the British, and that's why it's in there, because it happened. And regardless of what, what their, what their um, actual motivations are, you know, law enforcement is always going to run up against this, because it's very hard to know what is, you see the word? Unreasonable. That's a big loophole, isn't it? And incredibly hard to define. So law enforcement is always, I would argue, from their point of view, of very valid reasons. We want this to be as open to us as possible. We can decide what reasonable is. But you can also see the opposite point of view, I think. You see the loophole in? That's huge. So that's fourth. The Fifth Amendment, same deal. The British were holding people without a trial, so the Fifth Amendment confirms, especially in capital cases, which are things like murder. Now, don't write this down yet. Just write down the Fifth Amendment. It says no person shall be held answer for a capital evidence of his crime without an indictment of a grand jury. What it is, it's confirming right there. It's habeas corpus. It's confirming this and strengthening habeas corpus. Habeas corpus means. You cannot be held without an indictment. So you can't be held without being told what you're accused of at a trial. Is that spelled H-A-B-E-A-S? Yeah. Habeas corpus. It literally means what in Latin, the body or But it means that there has to be a procedure before you're if you're arrested and held. And once again, the British did it. And it does have some, the Constitution, and it applies here too, in case of uh, the military or in time of war or rebellion. That's the fifth. There's one more part of the fifth we have to put down. There, there are actually three big parts, but we're only going to do one more in our class. Nobody shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against themselves. So you don't have to give evidence against yourself. Have you ever seen in a movie or a television show where they say, I plead the fifth? That's the fifth. You don't have to. You can still give evidence, but you don't have to give evidence. But you have to say you're not giving evidence. You can't lie. And it doesn't mean that your spouse or family members won't be compelled to give evidence. Just that. Next, the Sixth Amendment. Sixth Amendment, speedy trial. There's other elements of it, but we care about speedy trial and one more bit I'll get to in a second. But speedy trial is really hard to find. Did anyone find speed? I don't think the whole one's long is speedy at all. As the uh, as, you know, the Earth is very old, so speedy trial could be I mean, if it's two years. That's the yeah. past, right? And the court system is overwhelmed. And so they're going to be slow anyways, which is very interesting. The crime rate, especially violent crime, has dropped like a rock. Lowest has ever been since they've recorded it. Since they've recorded the statistics on violent crime. And yet the court system is so overwhelmed. Fascinating, isn't it? You live in the safest time since, well, since they've been recording it. What about cyber bullying? Safe is <laughs> Thank you for adding that. That answers your question. Okay. Because it actually, if you don't feel safe, you're not safe. It's true. You know, if you don't feel safe, even though there's less violent crime than there's ever been. I feel recording. like we're being infringed on. Now, one more thing you must have. <coughs> they must have an assistant of a counsel. 
The Sixth Amendment also says that people must have the right, regardless if they can afford it, a right to counsel. The Supreme Court would confirm this in the in the uh, Gideon versus Wainwright decision in 62, 61, 1961. But that is why you get a public defender. What about the jury? Hmm? Was the jury an impartial jury? But you also said, I'm confused about that last part. All it means is that the per whoever is accused of a crime, they get a right to a speedy trial and a lawyer. Okay. Yes. So it says his defense. Does that have a like yeah, or it just means that person? It actually meant men, but we construe it to mean men and women. Absolutely. Even though in reality, that's one of the reasons why women aren't guaranteed civil rights under the Constitution. So when women were going to like they get trials. Women did not get equal trials, especially if they were married. Women did not have the same rights at all. That would be a major fight for women to get, even rights to just have, uh, to testify in a court. Angel, you have your hand up. Say it again. No. Not under the Constitution. No, not at all. The Constitution, women are not guaranteed equal rights at all. <coughs> So women are not a protected class under the Constitution. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said that there could be no discrimination based upon sex. But that's not a protected class. What that means is that there could be no discrimination based upon sex. And since 99.9% .9 of discrimination based upon sex was discrimination against women, that's where you get down. But it's not a protected class. That's a big difference. Uh, seven. All you need to know about seven, very quickly, civil cases, get a jury trial too. So if you sue somebody, it has to be big. Small ones, no, but they have a threshold. What is that? I Twenty five hundred bucks. Eight. No excessive bails and no cruel and unusual punishment. No excessive bail, no cruel and unusual punishment. You know, so someone's picked up for jaywalking, they can't simply say, "We're going to set the bail at forty five billion dollars." Because what a great way to keep someone locked up you don't like. That's actually one of the things that police states do. They they uh, arrest political prisoners on trumped up charges and then make the bail excessive. So it's one of those things, yeah, the British did this. But what, can someone define cruel and unusual punishment? Like something that does Oh boy, yeah. Sticking bamboo sticks inside their fingers? Uh, hey, this embowelment was not considered that cruel and unusual in, in 1000 AD. I would argue today, belaying someone is cruel. What? But I want to watch them try to shovel it that's, really right. that's the point. It's relative. But one very important thing that's really hard for all of us to wrap around, I wrap our head around, we all have this desire to think about this as terms of the crime. Shouldn't be more extreme crimes. Don't, you know, the punishment can get more cruel than usual. Doesn't say that, does it? It's just says not, period. Regardless, justice will be will be equal regardless of what your crime was. Is that what we have, quote unquote, humane executions? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's supposed to be less cruel, less unusual. Even though killing someone, I, I can't think of anything more cruel. So, you see, that's why it's such a gray area. But people justify, well, they committed a horrible crime. Wait a second, it doesn't say anything about the scope of the crime. That's why it grants Just the relevant thing is really yeah. important. There's all kinds of gray areas. Yeah, that's the reason they broke that one in the of the English law. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of it did. They looked at, and the English had a hodgepodge of laws and common law, including that. Remember the King's Proclamation about, yeah, yeah. But I think they also wrote it. Just big enough to where it can somewhat apply to our terms, but at the same time, a lot of it shouldn't necessarily be. I feel like things shouldn't be left so open for interpretation. Time change. It, it needs to change with the times. And so that's when they've written in such a way that it can alter with the change with time. And, we can, we can, it, and that's why they did that. They add much more. Sort of, if, they, if they didn't write it that way, it could also be, they could also have written that. What is a cruel like I mean, you guys just can't talk to so like, I have a question about it. It was about, I'm so sorry. 
I had a really good question of how you stop them how Wait, they try to list it? them down what's cruel? Oh wait, like they can, like if they didn't wrote how you wrote said that all crime is equal under the law, right? Yeah. Is that because they didn't want to keep them saying like, oh Jim Walking, that's that's the worst offense. Yeah. Stuff like that. It could be used to actually punish people that don't deserve it, or it would have made justice very uh, open to interpretation. You know, you do whatever you want. They wanted to make justice equal for all cases. Okay, nine we've already mentioned. Remember that one? That's you have rights. You have rights even if they're not listed. That's a big one, but also hard to interpret. Ten is very similar to nine. Ten is about the states. Powers that don't go to the U.S. government go to the states. Just like rights that aren't listed go to the people. Powers that aren't listed to the U.S. government go to the states. With the idea being that state power under this new federal system will be confirmed. But once again, I hope you can see the hole in that. What was that? What was that? Um, What's the clause? What's the clause that gives the federal government more power, but it's... Sid, did you say it? No, doesn't it start with an E? It starts with an E or an I or an N. The necessary and proper clause. Because of that necessary and proper clause, it gives the federal government more power. So this is very much open in the air. You see people who talk about they don't like the federal government laws, and sometimes they'll refer to themselves as tenthers for the <coughs> Tenth Amendment. But that's very much open to interpretation, especially when we use power in the national <coughs> government. If, for example, the Republicans have control of the executive branch, and maybe both houses of Congress, they're for a strong national government. And the Democrats are like, what about the Tenth Amendment? If it reverses, then the Republicans would be like, what about the Tenth Amendment? Whoever's not in power likes the Tenth Amendment. Yeah. So, wait, uh, 10th Amendment. 10th Amendment. Powers that don't go to the U.S. government go to the states. Okay. But because of that necessary and proper clause, there's a big hole. So, the Bill of Rights was done. Remember, this is all related to what's going on around the country. Everybody is now happy. Yes. The Fifth Amendment, yeah. that is the habeas corpus. And you don't have to testify because you're not coming. Yes. What is the case? Huh? What is the case? If you're accused of a crime, there must be an indictment and a trial. Mm -hmm. uh, seven. It's a court trial for a civil case. Jury trial. Yeah. Civil, yeah, jury trial. Thank you. And so we got the Bill of Rights. Everybody agrees. There is one big happy family. In fact, there's never been a political disagreement after this until I would say today. Or immediately after they got the government going. While they're debating the Bill of Rights, Alexander Hamilton has a plan for all of us. We're going to the moon yet. Yeah. Hamilton. And what we're going to talk about here is. When Madison's vision, at least that, at least what he claimed his vision to be, of no factions, of all the elites coming together and agreeing on all the issues, uh -uh, didn't happen. Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasurer, Treasury, <coughs> his vision of the future of the United States would be a vision he'd lay out in two pamphlets. One called, I'm sorry, uh, Report on credit, and another one called a report on manufacturers. And in it, he laid out that the future of the United States must be on a strong system based upon finance. Good credit, banking, moneyed interest in charge. Moneyed interest. Manufacturers, why do we want money in, why do we want money in interest? So they can begin industry. The Industrial Revolution had just begun in Britain. There was no industry in the United States. In fact, there's no industry as we know it outside any place beside Britain. In fact, the economic system called capitalism was literally just being created in Britain while this is going on. And what he's saying is we got to be more like Britain. Most Americans, especially men like Jefferson, 
They looked at the United States as, and their future, I'm going to own that piece of land and become an independent farmer. That's my goal. This is radically different. <coughs> this is urban and finance, and the fight begins here about the vision of the country. Are we going to be based upon finance and industry or agriculture? The first issue that will come up with this and show Hamilton's brilliance, and also, I would say he's frightening. Jefferson thought so. Issue number one, the public debt. The United States government had bonds. Bonds are way governments borrow money. The U.S. government actually calls them treasury bills, but they're bonds. And what a bond is this. Governments, when they want to borrow money, will issue bonds. People buy them. So they actually go to a bond market. People buy the bonds. And then in some predetermined time, the bond matures. It can be three months, six months, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, you know, 60 year bonds. So it mature in 60 years. Huh? Good one. <laughs> and so, with that, governments will pay it back plus interest. That's supposed to be a plus. They pay it back with interest. What's happening is this, though. If people don't think the government can pay back the bonds, the only way they can borrow money is to give even more and more interest, which dramatically increases their debt and makes it more difficult to convince people they'll pay it back. It's not paying back loans, which give you good credit. It's making people believe you can pay back your loans, give you good credit. Have you ever heard of something called a credit rating? That's not based upon, that's not necessarily based upon you paying back your previous debts. It's based upon the fact that you will pay it back and you probably will pay it back in the future. It doesn't mean you actually have paid it back. It's actually a really hackneyed uh, um, rating done by these private companies. And so actually the more debt you have, as long as you make your payments, the higher your rating. So it's not how much debt you have, it's if you pay it back. Well, the United States had the colonies had bonds. The states had bonds. The Continental Congress had bonds. The Confederation Congress had bonds. And the new U.S. government's going to have bonds. Nobody believes we can pay it back. People believe when it matures, they won't get their money back. So we won't be to borrow money in the future, and people are holding bonds that are what? Worthless. And that is the key element here. These bonds... Are worthless. At least that's what people think. Today there's a bond market that's trillions of dollars. But back then, you know, people had these bonds. A lot of soldiers were paid in bonds with the idea of we don't have money now during the Revolutionary War, but we'll give you money down the road. Daniel Shays, remember Shays Rebellion? He was a bondholder. And he thought, I'm not going to get a penny for this bond. So they started selling these bonds to. What do you call someone who buys something low and hopes to sell it high? Is it true? Say it again. Well, investors do this, but the term for it is speculators. Speculators are that type of investors. Investor. Speculators. We're buying it. And this is the amazing thing. Think about what happens if, if you have a bond that you say when it matures with interest will be hundred dollars. I'm just throwing a number out there. And you're saying, I don't know how to get hundred dollars. And a speculator comes up and says, you know, I'll give you a dollar for it. Would you take it? If you had no money, would you take it? And that's what was happening. People were, speculators were scooping up bonds at 1% of the value. It's kind of the well, now they have. They hope they find someone else. But now they have all these bonds that are still worthless. Hamilton proposed a bill called the Debt Assumption Bill. And it will pay back these bonds at 100% of the value. 
So if you held the bond the whole time, you get 100% of the value back. But think about the speculators. What's our profit margin here? Huh? <laughs> it's 10,000%. Not bad, huh? So think about speculators. They get it for a penny on the dollar, and they make a 10,000% profit. And that's Hamilton's plan. Okay, part of it is we pay 100% back, now borrow, now loan us money down the road. And that, we want good credit. But last thing for today, who buys, who speculates? <coughs> now, there are two different types of rich. Plantation owners have land, right? Remember, they have land and wealth and slaves. But they don't really have money. The merchant class, small, in cities, they're the ones who have actual money. This is the merchant class. They're the same people who are speculating. He wants them to have the money. Finish this tomorrow. Oh, it's a cliffhanger, isn't it? You're like, oh no. <laughs> what will the merchant class do with the money? Oh, you'll find out. What will they spend it on? What kind of world does he want? Huh? Yeah. So build backgrounds. I don't know who brought Where did we go? Why? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, we just got the ad set. I am going to sign 302 to 358 for. Let me look at that again. So I'll put it, I'll change it right now. Okay. I think it's 338 for Tuesday. But then we have an essay on Monday. I'm going to give you the essay questions tomorrow. We talk very briefly about that. And then we will. Uh, oh, talk a little bit about Hamilton and Jefferson, you know, the different points of view, which we're doing right now. And then we're going to watch like a 25 minute little video that really covers it now. And with amazing special effects. Maybe it's good you're not here because you guys will be so afraid. Um, it's pretty scary. So I'll just check them out. Okay. Yeah. So I've got a half on here, the uh, four questions on the back of this. Okay. Federalist. Now, why is it so late? I know, but the I don't really have a reason. I know, but the thing is, one day late, it's 30% off. Two yes. days late, it's three days late, it's zero. And then three days, it's yeah. But well, at least it's an assignment in. Okay. I, I have a few more things I'd like to turn in, but I haven't finished them. So I'm not going to unless they're finished, if that's all right. Get them in. Because right now in the great book, it